Snap Studios. This episode is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. What if comparing car insurance rates was as easy as putting on your favorite podcast? With Progressive, it is. Just visit the Progressive website to quote with all the coverages you want. You'll see Progressive's direct rate, then their tool will provide options from other companies so you can compare. All you need to do is choose the rate and coverage you like. Quote today at Progressive.com to join the over 28 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Comparison rates not available in all states or situations. Prices vary based on how you buy. Okay, so when I was 10, Rocky lived in the apartment underneath ours. He had Down syndrome, right? I only mention that because Rocky played it for all it was worth. He'd wander into our house, go rummaging through the fridge, and my mama never said jack to him. Even though she would have smacked my brother eye upside the head in a minute, spilled ketchup on her living room carpet. No problem. Practice juggling eggs while jumping up and down on her bed. Just don't do it again, okay? But Rocky was a good dude and extended his life license to his buddies. So when any of us broke a window or put a firecracker where it wasn't supposed to be, we just shout, Rocky! And Rocky come running and take the blame like a champ. Oh, I'm sorry, he say, grinning, knowing full well he couldn't really get in trouble. See, Rocky knew what he was doing. And we knew Rocky knew what he was doing. Everybody knew, but he got away with it anyway, because he was Rocky. His mother made him wear his glasses with a band, attaching them to his head like goggles, because she got sick of him losing them every other day. <laughs> and I don't know. I hadn't thought of Rocky in a long time. We were just kids. We moved, moved again, moved again, and I didn't do a great job keeping up. Not too long ago, my brother got sick, really sick. Start remembering things that didn't happen, but remembering, too, very clearly, things that did happen. One day he told me, man, man, we should have kept in touch with Rocky, man. You know, he was like our little brother, man. It's not right. So I told him, I kept tabs on Rocky. Really? Yeah. Rocky had the best life, dog. Because he was the best dude. And the smile that came over my brother's face, the happiness, the joy, it was so pure that I would have repeated that same lie to him a million times over without even a touch of regret. Rocky, man. <laughs> yup. Rocky. Today in Snap Judgment, we proudly present Transcendent. Amazing stories from people with the glow. My name is Ben Washington. Always remember, there are lies, there are damn lies, and there's the truth. Because you're listening. This is a listening. Snap Judgment. First up on the Snapped Up a Transcendent episode. Actually, where else would we go? India. We begin with a group of people all searching for transcendence in their own way. Now, we've changed some of the names to protect their identity. Snap Judgment's own Adiza Egan spoke to writer Scott Kearney, and he's got the story. So I took this summer job leading these uh, students through North India. We're going to go to all the holy sites, starting in Delhi, uh, going to uh, Varanasi, then on to Bodh Gaya, which is where the Buddha attained enlightenment about 2,800 years ago. I was in charge of sort of the day-to-day logistics, you know, organizing travel plans, getting the students to and from classes. And on this program, the highlight was this seven-day silent meditation retreat in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition. And in that, we would be examining sort of the nature of enlightenment and the fact of our own mortality. Among my students, I had 12. The best, the brightest, the prettiest, the the most put-together one was this woman named Emily O'Connor. 
Emily O'Connor was 21 years old, beautiful, driven. She had studied yoga for years. She was a debutante. Before she came to India, she dyed her hair brown uh, from blonde because she wanted to fit in and sort of feel one with the culture. Uh, she was always the student that you could go to and sort of know was centered and you know, I could rely on her to, to also look after other students and be sure they weren't getting themselves into trouble in a very challenging country to travel in. And on the last day of the retreat, there was a delay caused by a train derailing right outside of Bodh Gaya, and we had to stay an extra night. And on this night, it's three in the morning, and I'm lying in my bed under a mosquito net uh, you know, sound asleep. And all of a sudden, this student named Frank uh, runs into my room and says, oh my God, Emily's on the ground outside and she's not breathing. I run out of this sort of chamber and she's like right outside my doorstep. And I, I see her, she's lying, she's being rolled over by one of the other directors of the program. Uh, they're, they're fastening sort of a clavicle you know, neck brace on her, but it's clear she's not breathing. She has this really large bruise under her eye. Um, you know, I don't just don't believe it's happening. Here is one of my students dead. Just hours before, while everyone was sleeping, Emily snuck out of her bed and climbed onto the roof. There, she tied a scarf over her brown hair, wrote some words down in her journal, right before she jumped to her death. You know, she fell from this, this height and that roof. Um, was it this one or that one? She, she, she probably came from here, is my guess. You know, for the next few hours, we're, we're sort of recording all of the information that we can. You know, we take a video of the scene. Um, um, when I found her, I was coming around this corner here on this path. Wow. Uh, all right. These are the steps that she likely took. I think this is actually the only way out. Uh, and uh, and we go through her stuff, and I find her journal, and I read it. And and the last page, written probably just hours before she took her own life, was this message that she believed that she was a bodhisattva, uh, essentially just on the verge of enlightenment. And she said that all she had to do was take her own life to achieve this next state of enlightenment. March 10th, 2006. I am different from others in the sense that I have obviously lived very many previous lives and have done a lot of meditation and have good karma. I am ready to respect life's pleasures. I am a bodhisattva. I am not attached to death anymore. She took her own life because she believed she was on the verge of greatness, of something superhuman, something beautiful. And that to me was devastating. Because this wasn't a suicide because of depression or unhappiness. This seems like almost psychosis that was happening. And in that moment, I felt angry at her. You know, angry at the idea of enlightenment, giving her these this, this promise of bliss, you know, ended in death. She did this out of compassion, that she did this out of, out of some misguided sense of, of Buddhist theology. We are clearly out of our depth. Scott stayed with Emily's body, pouring ice on her in the 100-degree heat. I sat next to her body for three days, you know, trying to stave off, uh, you know, decomposition. Scott was the only director in the program who could strategize with the local cops in Hindi on how to get Emily's body from Bodh Gaya back to her family in the States. Then when he got back home, he pulled out his notes from Emily's journal and he read that last passage over and over. After I read her journal, I wondered how common is this? How common is it when you're on a meditation retreat or, or on a spiritual journey that you start to believe these grandiose ideas? Or how often is it that, that, that people end up in a mental asylum or crazy or dead after these things? And so I began investigating, began looking for other instances. And, and I collected journals and writings of people who had died on meditation retreats. 
Uh, I collected a journal of a guy who jumped off a monastery in Kathmandu. I followed the the story of this guy named uh, Jonathan Spolin, who disappeared in Rishikesh. And then I found a guy named Ian Thorson, who was pursuing meditation in the deserts of Arizona. He believed that he could attain wealth and become an angel just through meditation. Instead, he ended up dying in the mountains. Scott started investigating and writing about fake gurus and celebrity meditation leaders. He was on a quest to inform people about the dangers of pursuing enlightenment. And one day, he was sitting at his computer in his house in Long Beach, combing through Reddit. And there was this photo of this dude, bare-chested in, like, in underwear, sitting on a glacier somewhere north of the Arctic Circle with this sort of, like, smug, intense gaze and smile on his face. And his name was Wim Hof. Meet Wim Hof. For decades, he's trained his mind to help his body withstand the coldest conditions imaginable. He set 18 world records and baffled countless scientists with his ability to stay warm. Is it hot? out here or is it just me he sort of had this like alpha male chuck norris sort of thing going on uh he said that he was able to teach the power of consciously controlling your body temperature in these extreme environments wim hof basically said you could be superman he also said that you could cure your sicknesses with just the power of your mind i just smelled charlatan from like across the internet. This looked like And I figured that this could be dangerous, too, because if you're telling people that you can cure your sickness with the power of your mind, you might not get the medical treatment you need. Or if he says that you can go sit on an iceberg and be warm, that you could freeze to death. It seemed so obvious to me that, that this Wim Hof fellow was going to get people killed. I didn't want him to create more Emily's. At that point, Wim Hof was sort of a rising icon, but he hadn't achieved global superstardom. But I saw that as a potential. So I wanted to debunk him before he got famous. But to really evaluate Wim Hof, Scott had to experience his method firsthand. So he went to Poland to take one of his intensive seven-day trainings. So I get off the plane and the first person I meet is Wim Hof. And he is this sort of short, uh, older man with a big bulbous red nose and a green pointy hat that made him look like a life-size garden gnome. And he smells like terrible and dresses like haphazardly, like whatever was nearby him that looked like clothing he would just put on. And my first thoughts are like, okay, so you're Superman? Uh, but he also greets me with this really warm smile and it's like, oh, we're going to have a great weekend. We're going to win the war on bacteria. Yeah. People are going to give me a Nobel Prize and I am the best. And, and we're, we're rewriting all the science books. And he's saying all this stuff that just sounds like gobbledygook or spiritual mumbo jumbo, like universal love is going to come and save the day. And I'm like, oh my God, this guy is even worse than I thought. I mean, he's a nut. Nevertheless, Scott climbs into Wim's rickety white van. They drive through the snow to the outskirts of the city. Finally, they reach Wim Hof's camp. I throw my bags down in this sort of dilapidated farmhouse. I'm on the second floor, and I look out the window, and there's this dude sitting out there, his black hair, a beard, sort of pretty cut muscles, uh, in his black underwear, throwing snow on his chest, and there's steam coming off of him. And I'm like, what the hell is going on? Like, <laughs> A, why would you do that? And B, why is there steam? And my feeling is like, I do not want to do that. And the, the guy standing next to me is a, a Latvian martial artist. He looks out there, he's like, oh, I can't wait. And he runs outside to stand in the snow too. And I'm like, I'm just going to be sitting in this house for a week with crazy people. You know, later that night, I'm hanging out with Wim and we're playing a game of chess. We set up the pieces and, and you know, he knows that I'm there to debunk him. He's well aware of my intentions, but he also has faith that he's got something legit to share. And Wim and I are sitting across from each other in front of this wooden chess set. And 
you know, I, I, I played chess since I was in high school, and, and Wim is sort of this, you know, autodidactic guy who can seem to pick up anything. And we're playing the game, and at first he does these, like, like really good defensive moves. We play for probably a half an hour until he makes a mistake, and I crush him, thank you, God. And after I, I beat him in chess, he says, you know, you will try this tomorrow. You will try these methods. And it's also sort of like, all right, I gave you one. Now you give me one, Scott. You know, you can, you, you will do this program with me. And I'm like, yeah, of course I'll do it. You know, you're, you're obviously a, a, a fallible dude, uh, you know. <laughs> and, but yet despite these failings, you know, there, I could sense there's something really interesting here. And we actually get into our sleeping bags and he teaches us this, his breathing method. The Wim Hof method really only has two parts to it, right, which is breathing and then cold exposure. And the breathing is essentially, uh, you know, 30 deep, fast breaths. It sounds a little bit like this, like... <sighs> you get dizzy and lightheaded and your fingers tingle. And you do that, and then at the end of it, you exhale. You just go... <sighs> and let all the air out of your lungs, and you hold your breath. And I knew I could hold my breath for about 30 seconds. And I start doing his method. And within one round, I was holding my breath for like a minute, 20 seconds. And after three or four rounds, I was holding my breath for two, two and a half minutes at a time. And this is with empty lungs. And I thought that was really cool. After the breathing, they dropped down to the floor for push-ups. And Scott just busted out 40 right there. He was excited. Then it was time for the second and most dreaded part of Wim Hof's method cold exposure. Which I was not excited about. And Wim rightfully also said, it's going to be painful, and, and but this is a week-long process. And true to its word, we go outside and it feels like I'm walking on hot coals, like excruciatingly painful. And Wim just said, you stand here in the snow for five minutes and, and then you can go warm up. And man, that was the longest five minutes of my life. All of the veins in my, in my feet clenched closed like they had never been used before. And Wim looked at me and was like, this is the first time. This is, this is what happens. And uh, tomorrow it will be better. And I was in it. I was in it to try it. Over the next couple of days, Scott bathed in icy streams. He could now stand in the snow for five minutes, then 10 minutes, then 20. After a few days, the pain was gone. And at the end of the week, Scott and the other attendees approached Mount Snezka, a skiing mountain near the old dilapidated farmhouse. Scott and the others started on the mountain in just a bathing suit and some shoes, in a foot of fresh snow. And the, the hair on my legs gets like coated in little tiny snowballs. Uh, but I was on that mountain at two degrees Fahrenheit for eight hours, and I was never cold. I was hot the whole way up to the top. You know, meanwhile, skiers are coming down in their sort of jumpsuits, all turning around being like, oh my God, who are these people who are definitely going to die any minute from now? And yet my experience was euphoria. I climbed up a mountain eight hours, bare-chested and shorts in the cold, and felt warm, and that was seemingly miraculous. And yet there was also this other thing of like, did I push myself to a point where I could have killed myself? And, and I, I didn't actually have the answer to that. You know, beyond the grandiose talk of universal love, beyond the grandiose talk of superhuman powers, there's something earnest about whim, which is alluring. And, and I, you know, I, I go along with it. As I was learning to do the Wim Hof method after I, I met him, I, I kept on doing this 15-minute breathing meditation every morning and uh, push-up cycles and taking cold showers every day. When I go on runs in the middle of the winter, I, I go just in a bathing suit and shoes and started putting my body through the ropes. But I wanted a big challenge, right? I wanted something that was bigger than climbing up that mountain in Poland. I, and I learned that Wim was planning to climb Mount Kilimanjaro uh, at the beginning of the year. He was going to do it shirtless, and he was going to do it fast. Normally, it takes people about five days to safely climb Mount Kilimanjaro, and they do it in two to three mile stages. So what our plan was, was drastically faster. Than Wim Hof's plan was to climb the mountain in somewhere between 30 and 40 hours. 
and maybe even beat the record for fastest group ascent. Both American and Dutch researchers advised against it. They estimated the entire group could die of acute mountain sickness. But Scott felt that with the Wim Hof method, it wouldn't be a problem. I wanted a challenge that would floor me, that would honestly defy death. Because if I defied death, if I defied what everyone said was going to kill me, well, wouldn't that show that this method works? I am the guy who didn't believe in this. And if I can go from a radical unbeliever into this to somebody who not only believes, but then to go out to the world and say, hey, there is something here. Well, that's profound. Oh, it is just getting started, Snappers. Find out what happens when you chase a madman up a mountain. Listen, the stunning conclusion. When Snap Judgment, the transcendent episode continues, stay tuned. Support for Snap Judgment comes from Odoo. What is Odoo? Well, Odoo is an all-in-one management software with apps for every business need. Odoo has apps for CRM, accounting, sales, HR, inventory, manufacturing, and everything in between. And they're all in one easy-to-use software. And the best part about Odoo? All Odoo apps are integrated, helping you get things done faster and more efficiently. So when you think about business, think Odoo. To learn more, visit odoo.com slash snap that's o d o o dot com slash snap welcome back to snap judgment the transcendent episode when last we left writer scott carney was dead set on following biohacker wim hoff up mount kilimanjaro shirtless Scott hops on a plane and makes his way to Tanzania to meet Wim Hof and a couple other devotees. So here we are at the base of Kilimanjaro, and it's tropical. This is like broadleaf plants, you know, hot environment. And so the idea of going shirtless at that point was really not a big deal. And uh, there's a lot of local press there. And Wim uh, is standing in front of them saying, we are here together. We will all have buddies. We will be safe. And it, and there will be no ego on this trip. And, and he pauses and says, there is no ego. Only we go. After about a full day of climbing, they hit their first stop. They ate and they carried on in the rain. That night, they rested for about four hours before they started again. It got cold. People were putting on jackets. 20 hours into the ascent, they got to the last staging point, where they all sat down to eat. And Wim's like, no, 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 we didn't come up Kilimanjaro to have lunch. We came to win, we came to do this. And he like he says, no more resting. And then Wim just sort of when people are are just sort of like sneering at him, like, no, just give us an hour or something to rest up. We don't care about the record. He runs out of the the hut. He says, like, you you can come with me or you can stay behind. And, and, you know, the guides actually try to physically block him, but he doesn't care, and he sort of runs up the mountain. And I'm watching him disappear into the distance. He's wearing these bright blue shorts with birds on them and I believe an orange blanket over his shoulders just you know climbing up the mountain people were like forget this guy like like he, he's not going to push us we don't need to go put our, our lives at risk for him like this guy's crazy and as he gets maybe I don't know half a mile away I'm like damn it I guess I have to go <laughs> but I'm pissed at him I am so angry at Wim Hof because he's not doing the the we go thing. He is all ego. And so I just give in. I just protest. I throw on everything I have in my bag. I have like a sweater on and a thermal underwear and like a big puffy green jacket. And this is like my big you to Wim Hof. You know, he sees me coming and he sort of waits. And I say, Wim, wait up. And he turns to me and says, don't you challenge me, Scott Carney. And, you know, we're going to do this. And and I, and, I, and I said, look, Wim, I don't care about the record, but how do I know you're not going to just leave me on the mountain to die if I get into trouble? And somehow this message seems to, like, I don't know, resonate with him? And he's like, I won't leave you. 
And then so Wim, I, and then one other guy start climbing up the mountain, even though the guides are shouting at us not to. And, and I just watch his feet and we climb up this just incredibly steep, rocky slope. And, and, uh, and uh, there's this moment where he's, he's in front of me and I see his foot just slip a little bit and almost have to like put his hand down to catch himself. And I'm like, Wim Hof isn't like God, he's not superhuman. I'm not here on this mountain because of Wim. I've been on this six year journey because of me, because I wanted this challenge. And then all of a sudden this protest that I put on, this like sort of state puff marshmallow man suit just seemed ridiculous and I sort of stripped it down so I was bare chested again. At this altitude, everything goes dim. Scott's vision begins to narrow and he starts to feel faint. So I, I go back into the breathing method and I just, <sighs> I, and, I, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I focus on that, and, and then when I do that, the world brightens up again. Well, we're looking up at the last ascent, and I think this is a place called Jamaica Rocks. Um, it's sort of this wash of rubble, probably the hardest part of the ascent. And, you know, we're looking up, and, you know, here I am shirtless with wind howling around us. It's, it's uh, around negative 30 with wind chill. And Wim sort of nods at us and says, I, I think Gilman's point is enough. And it was what we were all thinking. Uh, you know, we're, we're fighting for breath. You know, the, the, the air is, is quite thin, and, and we're using the breathing method, which helps a lot. But, you know, there are still limits, and we're looking up, and it's howling. And, and, and it, even though we sort of look just straight up vertically, and it just looks like I'm going up a cliff, um, you know, if you just look down at your feet, one at a time, one at a time, and then, you know, I don't even like really realize it, but then I'm standing on the top of this mountain and and I'm looking down the other side at this ice field, right? That that sort of this glacier that goes steeply down the other side. I'm like, oh my God, I'm I'm here. And I and I breathe in that air, that sort of crisp, cold, pure mountain air. And I felt this connection to the world around me because, you know, in a way, the, the, the mountain let us get up there. That we, we didn't get to the summit of Kilimanjaro. We only made it to Gilman's Point, which is, you know, a, a hundred, a, two or three hundred meters shy of the true summit. But the point where you can go up the mountain and look down the other side. As everybody took one last picture of themselves on top of Mount Kilimanjaro, Scott looked down at his watch and realized they would beat their goal. And, you know, I looked back at, at what we could have done. You know, Uhuru was just around the rim of this volcano uh, on the other side of the, the caldera. You could almost see it through, through the snow and haze. And, and I knew that I wouldn't make it there. I, I wasn't trying to push myself past that point of no return. Whereas Emily, you know, embraced it. Right? She embraced the idea of death as a new beginning for, for something. And that's not what I want. You know, the reason we turned back at Gilman's point is because I wasn't sure that I'd be able to make it. And I'm not curious at this point about what's on the other side of death's threshold. Uh, I want to be on this side for as long as I can. Thank you, Scott Carney, for your story. I'm going to stick around here at sea level. Look at all that running around in the snow and your tidy whities Listeners, please note, these methods are dangerous for real. No joke. According to Scott, four people have died using the Wim Hof breathing method while free diving underwater. Find out more about this world. Scott Carney's book, The Enlightenment Trap, is out now. We'll have links to that and Scott's other works at snapjudgment.org. Original score... On This Story was by David Last. The piece was produced by Adiza Egan. When Snap Judgment returns, you can check out any time you like, but you can never leave. There's plenty of room at this hotel in California, Snap. It's such a lovely place, such a lovely face. You are not going to want to miss this story. When Snap Judgment, the transcendent episode continues, stay tuned.
Welcome back to Snap Judgment. My name is Glenn Washington. Now, we're about to take you on a trip. It is not exotic. It's not a faraway land. It's not even hard to find, but it is special. We're going to the Cadillac Hotel, a single-room occupancy hotel in San Francisco's Skid Row, a neighborhood called the Tenderloin. The Cadillac was built just after the 1906 earthquake. In the early days, it was a glamorous way station for visitors looking to dance, to listen to jazz, to gamble. Over the years, though, the neighborhood changed, and so did the Cadillac. Now, when people come to the hotel, they tend not to leave. Our story starts when one of the Cadillac's residents, Monica Santiago, she finally makes it out. Just not alive. Snap Judgment. I went there on a Sunday and she was she was alive and kicking and then I went there Thursday and she had died Wednesday. And nobody had alerted you. Nobody alerted me, no. And so I lost I lost track of her. Hetty and Monica had been side by side for a long time. They were partners for 13 years, best friends for most of their lives. But when Monica was only 54, she was diagnosed with ovarian cancer. The last time I seen her, I climbed in bed with her. She said, come up here and watch TV with me. And um, we were watching cartoons, singing with the cartoons. And... and then how many days later was it that you found out she died? Just a couple days, or just two days. And so you walked in and you asked to see her and what did the nurse say? She passed away. I asked her what happened what happens to the body and I didn't want her in the morgue. I did. it just gives me the creeps the morgue. They weren't supposed to tell me anything. You're not you're not a relative, you're not a power of attorney and you're not next of kin. Same thing over and over. Monica had promised that they'd grow old together, but she knew this day would come. As her cancer progressed, she started talking about the end and what would happen after it. She and Hetty walked along the San Francisco Bay near Fisherman's Wharf. We went out there one time when they were um, setting off um, the fireworks and we could see them from there. And she said, that would be a really nice place to have your ashes scattered because you could see the, the fireworks all the time. So when Hetty showed up at the hospice where Monica spent her final weeks and found out that Monica had died, she knew what she had to do. Get Monica cremated just like she'd wanted. Hetty asked, what have you done with Monica's body? Well, they don't, they don't want to tell you. Who are you? You know, like somebody's going to want to know where she is that doesn't love her. You know, come on. I just want to see her dead body. You know, come on. That's stupid. The lady at the hospice wouldn't give up a thing. First she said she wasn't authorized to talk to Hetty. Then she said she didn't even have the information. From then on, Hetty's mission was to find Monica's body and get the money together to have it cremated. See, Hetty and Monica's lives weren't constructed like most middle and upper class lives, which meant Monica's death also didn't go down in the normal, next of kin, last will and testament kind of way. Instead, her body got stuck in a grim kind of limbo. No one knew where it was. What little family she had was far away. What little money she had wasn't enough to cover final arrangements. All that she owned was left in a small room at a place called the Cadillac Hotel. Before she died, Monica had told Hetty it would cost 250 bucks to get her cremated. I told her I'd get the money. I told her don't worry about it, because she, she went rather quickly, and um, and she said, you know, just take my last check and do it, you know. And I said, I don't, I don't think they're gonna give us your last check, Monica, you know. Hetty and Monica had lived for years in separate rooms at the Cadillac, a residential hotel in San Francisco, kind of a cross between a boarding house and a flop house. Like a lot of people who live at the Cadillac, they had the bad luck of being poor and everything that goes with it, addiction, illness, general down and outness. Okay. At the monthly bingo game in the hotel lobby, news of Monica's death is spreading. It sort of hangs in the air. Bingo! Uh, you got bingo, Mary? I think so. Mary, you did it! Yeah, Mary, you did it! Mary reluctantly claims her prize, 
she's still reeling about Monica. I'm sad because Monica died. She was nice to me. Yeah. On a piece of printer paper posted near the elevator, next to two white candles, there's a sign that says, Rest in peace, Monica Santiago. It has a picture of Monica, drinking a bottle of Corona. We walked by earlier, they didn't have her picture up, and I didn't know her name. Hetty's in Monica's room, sorting through the stuff she left behind, deciding what to keep and what she might be able to sell. She loads up a handcart of things she's willing to part with, rolls it downstairs, and out onto the sidewalk. Yeah, I figured two bucks a drawer, you can have the whole drawer for two bucks. You know, it's got batteries in it, it's got uh, uh, pens and markers, and, and, and then this one's two dollars, too. Eddie lines everything up on Eddie Street, right out in front of the Cadillac. There are blenders, drills, wall hangings. There's a box filled with fedoras and newsboy caps. People coming in and out of the hotel stop to look. Is this a yard sale? Yeah, it's a yard sale. So it's a Monica sale. This is Hetty's chance to raise the 250 bucks to pay for Monica's cremation, if she ever finds her body. This is Monica, that's why this reminds me of Monica. But, but look at all of her paints. <laughs> I'll take her paint. Okay, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, I will. Right? Monica, okay. Monica painting. And paintbrushes. There were stuff. things about Monica that were so, okay. she was so. You she can was, hold it like that. Oh, yeah, she was, so, she was so butch. <laughs> she was being a lesbian. That's just, that she made me feel like Marilyn Monroe when I first met her. I jumped on her lap and said, hi, honey. She was so I got it this way. <laughs> but I know I the delicate way. Monica. Through this way here. Oh, Mona, I want yeah. Ma, Momo back. Yeah, 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 I want my yeah, Momo. Back. <laughs> <laughs> the girls, right? They used to call yeah. us the girls. Oh. Lots of people look and talk and remember Monica. But nobody really buys anything. Yeah, I see a lot of stuff that I, if only I had, could get it, but I can't afford it. <laughs> in this neighborhood, the Tenderloin, everyone's in more or less the same position. I ain't got no money. It's the end of the month. So most of those people that get checks or Social Security or whatever, around about this time of the month, the last week of the month, we all broke, more or less. We count pennies. Nickels and dimes, if we got them. <laughs> Hetty only manages to sell one hat and a brass unicorn before a fight erupts on the corner. It's a regular day to the lawn. You know, there's always some fussing and there's some fighting. And every so often, you might get a stabbing and a gunshot or something. <laughs> Every so often, not all the time. I'm getting the hell out of the streets, man. Who knows? Hetty made only a couple bucks from the sale. After a few days, she started just handing stuff off to people in the hotel for free. That's why she wouldn't give away any of her clothes. She didn't want to see them on other people. But I'll enjoy seeing them on other people. (laughs) And whatever stuff was left in Monica's room after that, Hetty crammed into her own. This is hers. This is hers. I got all these little boxes and stuff of her jewelries and then the stuff she used to like to put together, watches and stuff. Back in the 80s, Hetty was married to a guy named Louie. And Monica was Louie's best friend from growing up in New York. That's how the girls met. Hetty's husband, Louie, invited Monica to come stay in San Francisco. In walks this dyke. <laughs> I was like, oh my God. Thank you. <laughs> it was love at first sight. Mm-hmm. She was wearing pigskin boots. She was all dressed in white. She had uh, that Puerto Rican skin of hers. You know, she was lovely. Monica was a force of personality. Sharp dressing, no BS, fiercely loyal to people she liked, just fierce to people she didn't. Hetty and Louie were both infatuated with her. Louie told Monica she had to choose between the two of them. And, and she's like, can I just stay home with you? And I said, sure, you know, and, and I kept her. I kept her here. And then you guys lived together for a long time, huh? mm, 13 years. Yeah, we moved down to L.A. We moved to Chicago. Me and her went to Chicago. They were barely 20. They became adventurers, drifters. They bounced from odd job to odd job and state to state, living in hotels just like the Cadillac. Our feet didn't hit the ground for very long. I mean, we got picked up right out of L- L.A., and we were in Kansas in no time, you know. And um, then we hitchhiked out of Kansas, and uh, we were on our way to New York. 
They had lots of hustles, fixing up old motels, delivering cars hundreds of miles for small fees. They also had problems over the years. Monica's mental illness, Teddy's HIV, a tendency to overdo it on drugs. But wherever they were, they made it work. We never fought or anything crazy like that. I met so many crazy people in this city, you know, and she, she just wasn't crazy. You know, she was crazy, crazy nuts crazy, but but she wasn't crazy. She never pulled nothing on me, you know, stupid. We never talked bad about each other or, or you know, stole from each other or anything like that. We never even thought of that, you know. I love Monica. She loved me. Once she moved to hospice, the end came fast for Monica. But Hetty was there every couple of days by her side. She was so brave. I had bought her a, <laughs> this pillow that... that Edgar had bought two of them. Edgar was an old friend of theirs in the Cadillac. It's a $300 pillow from Macy's. And he bought them for like five bucks a piece. This guy had stole them, I guess, from Macy's out front. But it still had the price tag on it and everything. It was, it was a beautiful pillow. And uh, um, so I said, we'll give one to Monica. Hetty took it with her to the hospice. It was the only thing she could think to bring. Because what do you give a girl that has nothing, you know, that doesn't need anything? Right? You give her comfort, right? Now, none of the nurses that saw Hetty at the hospice, day in and day out, will tell her where Monica's body's gone. So she's stuck in this bureaucratic no-man's land. I'm putting up candles every day, every day. Putting up candles. I love candles. Puerto Ricans have this thing for seven days after they die. They, they pray for seven days. I went back to the hospice, looking for that person that's going to tell me something. I wanted to know where she was. I wanted to know. I needed to know. And they told me I had to come back when that lady was there or that guy was there. They gave me a number, and I called back. She called again and again. She got mixed messages. Sometimes the person who knew what happened to Monica wasn't available. Other times, the people on the phone said they weren't allowed to talk to Hetty even though she'd been taking care of Monica this whole time. I called the office a couple of times. I texted him. I got on the computer, and I tried to email him. And no answer. The system sucks. The system's got to be changed. Something's got to change. Hetty says that Monica had sort of worried about this happening. As her last days approached, Monica's idea of having her ashes scattered at Fisherman's Wharf became all tangled up in logistical concerns. She was scared that she'd be buried with other poor people in a single grave. She's like, what, what's going to happen to me, you know, after I'm dead? And I said, well, we're going to do what we said we we're going to do. We're going to spread our ashes. And she said, OK. And I said, but we got to figure out what they do with you when you die. Now reality is starting to look a lot like Monica's worst case scenario. Hetty's worried, too. Because I fear that. I fear that, you know, being someplace that I don't want to be when I die. That fear is especially hard to get away from here in the Tenderloin. In this neighborhood, death is a fact of life. It's out on the streets. Just up the block from the Cadillac, a guy named Demo was stabbed in front of a bodega called TNL Smoke Shop. A teacher and a group of school kids walk past a little shrine for Demo, a milk crate surrounded by votive candles and bouquets of flowers. On top of the crate are a couple ferns, a farewell card, a soggy pack of Newports, and a big smiley face balloon just bouncing in the rain. In the lobby of the Cadillac, the benches and chairs have all been moved to the side. There's an altar set up with a little gong, incense, candles. Otherwise, the hotel's business as usual. The doorbell rings at the front gate. People run up and down the stairs. So we've gathered here today to celebrate the life and mourn the death of Monica Santiago. The chaplain has never met Monica. He travels from hotel to hotel, performing death rituals for people he knows nothing about. The services usually take place in the hotel lobbies. The chaplain says he likes celebrating the sacred in the midst of chaos. Monica 
The great mystery we all face is no mystery to you now. There are maybe 15 people at Monica's service. Noticeably, Hetty isn't one of them. I just can't believe that somebody can go that fast. When I came to the Cadillac, I think it was the first meal, I don't know what meal it was that we had. And I saw Mo, and she was drunk. <laughs> and she kind of staggered across the lobby. And I thought, I have to meet this person. I just instantly knew I had to know her, because she was, she kind of had this style. She and her neighbor, that Daryl, remember Daryl? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. They, were so they, fancy, they were both, yeah. they were the best dressed two people at the Cadillac. Yeah, she had New York style. She did. She was straightforward. I mean, she didn't mince her words. Mm -hmm. No. No, you tell me. No political correctness there. Oh, no, no, baby. No, 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 no. Mm -hmm. And remember two years ago, she, she almost died of pneumonia and she woke up in Seton Medical Center, didn't know where she was, <laughs> ripped the IVs out. Oh. <laughs> Well, in the hospital, she tried to climb out the window. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. After the service, the hotel managers hand out cookies, and the chaplain plays one of Monica's favorite songs. I'm fine. I'll kill myself tonight, so you smell me in a few days. No, I'm fine. The guys from rooms 410 and 243 joke around. They smell people here before they find them. <laughs> it's true, they do. They find dead people by the smell of them. Well, it happens on your floor. I'm not on phone. Well, listen, Hetty I'm couldn't bring know. herself to attend the memorial service. They were having the eulogy downstairs. I didn't really want to go downstairs. She stayed in her room, anxious. It was a horrible day. And made one more phone call to the hospice. They got sick of hearing me call. They just got sick of hearing me call. And I talked to the right person. I talked to the right person. Finally. It was a new person that I hadn't talked to before. She broke him down, and they put her through. But I got a hold of the guy... What the guy at the hospice told Hetty was something completely unexpected. In all her wandering mental loops, she'd never even dreamt it up. He said that she had contributed her body to science. It was a last-minute decision. The whole time Hetty was looking for Monica... She had gone to Stanford. She was in Stanford. They were going to study her for cancer and this and that. She got to do that because we didn't think we'd be able to do that. You know, because me with AIDS and her with cancer, we didn't think we were going to be able to do that. And so that was really cool. We said at, we were going to do ashes because we didn't think they'd need our bodies for anything because they're so doped up. And, you know, we just, our bodies are beat, you know. We figured nobody would want them. She's where she wanted to be, you know, and better place than where we thought she was going to be. You know? But I wouldn't have let her be any place bad. Is there like a place, since her body was given to science, a place where you would kind of go and honor her? I keep going back to her room. It smells like her. Yeah. I like the way people smell, you know, that are close to me. It brings them close to me. The hospice passed Monica's body along to Stanford University. Her empty room, 2.30, will get passed along soon, too. The hotel manager, a woman named Magali, is waiting to rent it out again. Magali chased me yesterday. She wanted me to, she said, are you ready to give up the room? I said, yeah, I've got almost everything given away down there. She said, yeah, give me a couple more days. And she said, okay. Because it smells like her down there, you know. What did Monica smell like? I don't know. She smelled like patchouli. I got some of her perfume in my bag. In my bag. I was the first thing I took out of her room. Patchouli. Patchouli. That's what she smells like. Big love and thanks to Hetty Torres and all the residents and staff of the Cadillac Hotel for sharing your story with the Snap. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Original scoring by Renzo Gorio. That piece was produced by Parker Yesko with assistance from Anna Sussman. Snap.
that was produced by the team that has already been where you're trying to go. Don't hold back the love for the Uber producer, Mark Ristich. Pat Masini Miller is this close to enlightenment. Anna, Third Eye Sussman, Three Days and Three Nights with Joe Rosenberg, Eliza in the Beginning Smith, Adiza, Universal Life Force Egan, Liz, Past Life Mac, Renzo, Other Side Gorio, Leon Morimoto knows only you can prevent forest fires. Nancy, Mother Earth Lopez, the Druid Teo Decat, and Jasmine Aguilera. She doesn't go for all that mumbo jumbo. And even though this is not the news, no way is this the news. In fact, you could learn a breathing technique that would keep you warm in the most bitter conditions only to discover it is cold outside now. All that could happen to you still not be as far away from the news as this is. But this is PR. 